Welcome to the Sacred and the Profane podcast. I'm your host, Shannon McNally. We will be speaking with elders, musical luminaries, medicine people, and session players about everyday magic and the past, present, and future of heartfelt and soulful real music. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Sacred and the Profane podcast. My guest today is James McMurtry, one of my very favorite songwriters on planet Earth. James, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, all things considered. Where are you? Uh, well, I'm in Lockhart, Texas. What you been up to? Well, I, I mostly sit in the backyard watching the cats glare at the dogs, but uh, every, every <laughs> so often I do a, a live stream from right here at the kitchen table. You've been doing live streams. How are they, how are they going? They're going well. I got, you know, some uh, pretty dedicated people out there that they, they log on every week. And... So let's see. Um, I think you have a new record in the can, maybe, or you've been working on a new record? Just about. Uh, I, we actually started it in June of 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, went out to L.A. and did some tracking and overdubbed over the course of the rest of that year. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then of course, the lockdown hit, and, and uh, we still had some recording to do. I did a little bit of... Uh, I had Buck Allen come do some keyboard work out at uh, Dripping Springs at the Zone studio. And um, Ross Hogarth has been out there trying to mix it. And uh, just about the time he really launched into the mix, he uh, he, uh, he tore the macula in his right eye. So oh. it makes it very hard to stare at the waveforms for eight hours a day like you need to when you're mixing a record. So so it slowed down, but he's, he's supposed to be finishing up uh, pretty soon here, and we'll get it to mastering, and mm-hmm. hopefully it comes out someday. I, for one, will look forward to that day. I did, I have to admit, I have heard a little bit of it, just as a bird on the yeah, you got your on a branch. Yeah, yeah, I have spies. So You've yeah. infiltrated the music industry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I only have very select few people that I spy on. So it's a very short list. You know, one of the things I love about your writing is just, it's, it's um, just so expansive. It kind of boggles my mind, actually. And um, I was wondering if you would uh, maybe expand, expound a little bit just on where does that all come from? I'm always, that's always my first thought as a songwriter when I listen to your songs, I'm thinking, where did that come from? Well, for me, it comes from fear, mostly. You know, fear of, of not having a job in livelihood. You know, I, I tend to put my homework off. I don't usually write songs unless I have to make a record. And I don't feel like I have to make a record till the touring draw starts falling off. Mm-hmm. And I'm usually in a jam and I have, have to get in a, you know, major hurry to get it done. Um, mm-hmm. Which is kind of what happened this time. I, I mean, Ross is pretty busy working with the uh, Edgar Winter and various people, and he called up and said, James, you know, you, we've been talking about this for a couple of years now. you you got to write some songs, and we, we got to go ahead and just book the studio time so you'll write the songs. He says, I know you. You'll do it. And I said, okay. So we pulled the trigger on the project, and lo and behold, the songs came in. Right. Well, that's that's sort of forcing the muse, and, you know. That's- well, I... I I, I always did that early in my career when I was younger and, and could pull it off regularly. Uh, I don't do it as much anymore, but this time I just, I just, I had a bunch of songs started, but I just couldn't finish those things without a deadline. Well, I for one appreciate a deadline. I almost do nothing without one, and yeah. I got to be right up on it, too. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel your... Homework uh, on the school bus is what it is. <laughs> Thematically... Your songs uh, all feel like movies to me. Like the imagery is so clear, and there's so much sense of detail, and uh, that's what's very that's what's so impressive to me is that sense of detail. Like, well, with me, it comes from dialogue. I mean, I, I hear lines in my head, and I think, okay, who said that? So then I come up with a character that might have said those lines. <laughs> And then maybe I can get a story. I kind of I work backwards just from a couple of lines and a melody. I like that. Do you, you know, do you write and then hone it back, or do you 
I write and rewrite. You know, I, I used to when I when I used legal pads, I used to go through a whole legal pad and writing a song because you know I'd write a couple of verses and then I'd rewrite them on the next page and tweak them as I go. And it's, it's mm-hmm. mostly just a way of keeping the mind moving so that you don't get stuck. I'm a big fan of legal pads myself. Yeah, I've kind of gone back to them. I, I did write. Uh, uh, the record I did with C.C. Edcock, I, I wrote that entirely on an iPhone 3. <laughs> it had, it had that notes app that looked like a legal pad. And, yes. and I've, I've found other apps that, that kind of try to duplicate that, but I never could get it. It wouldn't make the brain work. There was something about that, that black script on the yellow screen that worked. And um, since I dropped that iPhone and broke it, I haven't been able to write on an iPhone since. <laughs> but I've gone back to the paper. Well, I like writing on paper. I essentially only only write on paper when it's a fresh new idea. Well, the know? phones are good, though, because you always have one. It's like you don't have to search for a bar napkin to write something down on, you know, when, when you get a line. You get you don't yeah. forget as much that way. And you know, I learned over the years, you know, you don't trust yourself to remember something later on when you got a piece of paper in front of you. <laughs> you got to write it down right then, at least at my age. I don't know. I think you're absolutely right. My my mind wanders so fast that I have no idea. Like it's just gone. And my brain's on to the next thing. So yeah. the, the pandemic doesn't help with that, really. Yeah. There, there's no time anymore. There's no weeks. You know, this yeah. is day, 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 day. It's like it's all gone free jazz. <laughs> one. It's all one. It's all one. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I enjoy you on. Uh, I enjoy you on social media. I have to say. Well, yeah, it's a good tool. I mean, I, I, I try to start a feeding frenzy every now and then, because you know, it, it, if I say something outrageous, then, I, then I'll, I'll, you know, some people will cheer it and some people will get mad. And so it's sort of, it's a Trumpian tactic, really. I mean, he did that same thing. He he knew he could inflame the left, but the louder the left yelled, the more people would hear it. So I'm sort of trying to do that from the other direction, except I'm not running for office. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> That's why we like you, James. But I, 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 I mean, mean, he, he understands the concept that, that press is press. You know, Keith Richards said that years ago, bad press is still press. Uh, a few months ago, we lost Billy Joe Shaver. And uh, that one really hurt my feelings. It was very sad. Yeah. That, um, what uh, did, did you know, Billy? I knew him sort of, uh, and he he was always very nice to me. And, and one time he did me a particularly good turn. But we were supposed to do this, you know, songwriter in the round thing with me and Billy Joe and a couple other guys, and we had a like an issued contract. It was a done deal. And then the promoter called my agent and said, "Well, the venue owner will not allow James on the stage because of his politics." And I thought this was, yeah. You know, raw deal but whatever and so i went on about my business and then it turned out i, I was on uh, lightning i was on uh, compadre records at the time mm-hmm. and billy joe was also on compadre records mm-hmm. and compadre accidentally sent me his 1099 form uh-huh. which had his phone number on it so i called him up i said billy uh, i got your 1099 i'll forward it to you and by the way i didn't quit that show i got thrown off it because of my politics the next day, Billy Joe called up. So James, I just want you to know, I I I, I quit that show because uh, that's bullshit. That was nice. You know, and he leaned kind of right. You know, he and I didn't. You know, I don't think we agreed really on politics, but he just thought it was you know ridiculous that somebody would throw me off a show on the basis of it. Well, I like that story. I didn't know him very well at all. Um, I didn't meet him a few times, of course. Yeah, yeah well, he was always around. He was in the community. You know, I mean, a lot of these people we lose, it's kind of like, even if you didn't know them well, I say it's like one of your neighbors that you see in the post office line every now and then. And you, yeah. You know, and then suddenly they're not there, and it's it's weird. Ramsey Midwood and I conspired one time to get Billy Joe Shaver to come out and do a show with us. And... Uh, and uh, we offered him a few thousand dollars for like half an hour. And, and uh, we'd go, I told him, I'd come up to Dallas, I'd come get him in Waco, I'd bring him home. We'd have the band all ready. We'd know the songs. Like we could, we would make it as easy as pie, whatever he wanted. And uh, 
and um, about a week later, I heard that I had called Gary Nicholson and asked him to call me and, you know, call Billy and see if he would do it. And initially, Billy said yes. A couple, like a week later, Billy called. Um, Gary talked to Billy again. We were trying to finalize it all. And he said, actually, I'd rather pay her a few thousand dollars not to have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, no. Well, I've had every form of natural disaster interrupt just about every record I've ever made. So... Yeah, you make them and maybe they come out, you know, I don't worry too much about that anymore. Mm -hmm. A completed song, I mean, it always looks like a statistical impossibility when you start on it. Um, and I had one come in, that started years ago, I started, I, I took this Wendell Berry short story and I flipped the point of view around and changed some stuff in it and put it to verse. But then I never could finish it. And well, then I, I go out to L.A. to make the record just now. And I, I barely got into town before rush hour. You know, just one of those rattling down the 10. I get off in Culver City. And first thing I did was gas up the, the van so that if there was an earthquake and I had to sit on the freeway for another four hours, I wouldn't run out of gas. But you know, I got to the, the roadway in in Culver City, yeah. which is fairly dilapidated. And, and there was a, a nice kind of little pizza joint next door that had a good glass of Malbec. And the owner told me that that roadway in, the, the locals called it the roadkill in because there had been a hostage situation and SWAT team had had to shoot somebody through the window upstairs. And so that's it, it got his name. But, but you know, I, I was recovering from the freeway experience with that glass of Malbec, except it was nice, except that the, the, the the system was playing every obnoxious 70s and 80s hit that was ever on the radio and I was just about to leave and I hear Freddie Mercury going, Mama, I've just killed a man. Well, the song I was working on was kind of in that vein. I thought, well, I, now i got to go finish that song. You know, I'd forgotten about it until I heard Freddie Mercury. Well, uh, do you have any plans for traveling or, you know, have you... Have you, has that started to open up any bit for the summer or uh, fall? I, or make it I don't envision traveling in, in before fall of, of this year. Yeah. I just can't see how it can happen. We, we're not vaccinating enough people fast enough. And I can't conscience going in and standing up in front of people singing. It'd be like sneezing at them for an hour. Let's talk about your uh, live streams. My live streams. Uh, well, uh, every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Central, I... I tune up five or six guitars and sit here and play for an hour mm -hmm. on Facebook Live and uh, then I do it again at 1 p.m. on Sunday because uh, if I start at 1 p.m. the Europeans are are still awake and mm -hmm. uh, the Californians are finishing breakfast and I kind of have to think globally with this streaming stuff. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the sweet spot, huh? I thought about getting up at five in the morning and seeing if I could get, you know, uh, Uzbekistan or wherever. <laughs> <laughs> And if you do it long enough, it, you can start to have fun at it, which I, I've gotten to that point where, I'm, you know, at first I was very nervous about the technical aspects of it. I couldn't, you know, the this, this stream would lag or it would freeze up. And yeah, yeah, you gotta you gotta get good streaming software. I think OBS is pretty good, but you know, th there are people that are that are, are better at it than me. Uh, Mary Gaucher is doing a real good job with it because you know, you know, she. Uh, they do a thing they do a, like a multi stream thing where they're going to they're going to youtube and to facebook and whatever mm. they can do uh, oh god that is not my forte no mine either but it's kind of something we have to do just to stay out there uh, I've, I've gotten better at it mm. uh, the one rule is if it works at all don't mess with it <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times my my screen will go dark but kelly will be sitting here monitoring on her computer and she says no you're fine you're up you everybody else can see you just you can't so i don't mess with it at that point <laughs> i mean i can kind of get past the fact that there's no feedback from an audience i can hear them or you know or feel it actually is i mean if, if, well if you do facebook live you get a, a steady stream of comments down to but can you read them while you're playing? Well, I can't, but I don't want to. No, I no, it they get so really distracting. I don't wear my glasses, I, but as long as there's something moving, I know there's somebody out there. Oh, and that's point. just, you know, because I, I can't hear people talk in the audience either when I'm playing live on, in a Hopefully. venue. So that's fine <laughs> with me. 
But yeah, I, I do like to see some movement out there of some some sort. Yeah, the, yeah. R, the RE20 works well. I mean, I, I just had this mic because I used to do a lot of live radio, and that was the best broadcast mic. But a lot of stations had gone to SM7s because they were cheaper. Oh, so, so you I take just, your own mic to radio stations? I would take my own mic to the radio because I know how to play to it. Hmm. And, you know, we, we do whole band things with one mic. As long as I had, if I had a, headphones with a, either an air signal or a room signal so I could tell what's going into that mic, I could move around and block out what I didn't want. You know, right. if the snare drum was too loud, I'd get in front of it, that sort of thing. And then the, the, the deal was just play past it. Don't ever hit that mic straight on because, you know, FM radio had that compression on it. Mm -hmm. And if you hit it too hard, hit the mic too hard, everything would shut down. Mm -hmm. More was less and less was more. Kind of backwards. But uh, it seems to work for streaming as well. You know, it's just, it's just a different, another instrument. Like, you know, even li live radio, when you play it on radio, the air was the instrument. And when you play mm -hmm. in a room, the room is the instrument. And yeah. you know, it all reacts to whatever components you throw into it. You might have a PA, and hopefully if you do, you got a decent sound man running it. But it's really, you're not just playing the guitar, and you're not just singing. You're playing the room. And in this case, the internet is the room. That's so true. McMurtry's I, rule. I like it, but I've never really thought of that before. Um, I guess I was always in such a hurry. Just it was I was always in straight survival mode just to get to the venue. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Well, that's what Bromberg told me. That's what you're paid for. He play the room said, or just to David Bromberg, he, he said you're paid to travel, and play is what oh, you yeah. get to do if you if you do your oh. job right. You get to play for fun. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right about that. Do you miss the driving? No. No? I would have thought, I, you know, I really don't. Um, and I'm real surprised at that because I was addicted to it for a while. Uh, even if I wasn't on the road, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to get in the truck and go hunting or something and drive five hours every so often just to feel right. Mm -hmm. I don't. It took about, about a month of being home. And um, I think part of it is, uh, past a certain age, the highway beats you up a little bit. Even, you know, vans ride a lot smoother than they used to, but they're still rattling down the road, and your spine can feel that. And when you're home for a month or so, your spine realizes it doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> and, you know, there, there was pain that you didn't, not, not so much pain, but ache. There were muscle aches and joint aches and things that happened because you're, you're just constantly on the freeway, and uh, I don't miss that at all. I don't really look forward to to experiencing that again. Um, yeah, I thought that was just being a girl. Was no, all, I'm hurting. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> no, but yeah, I know. I do. I do miss. I I still miss the move, and I I still miss the. And I'll I'll just take myself for long drives every now and then, just to kind of break through the thing but you gotta get out of the house yeah. I, I do i do miss the food yeah unfortunately i'm gonna always miss some of that food because a lot of those restaurants are, have gone out of business yeah I and mean, fish on bleaker street in new york city is gone i hear you know i had the best fish and chips and blue point oysters in the world i thought i genuinely miss new york city i really yeah i genuinely miss it I miss Louisiana too. I haven't been in Louisiana in a minute and I miss it. I miss New Orleans. Those are two places I really miss. Do you cook? I was, I was raised on restaurant food. My father didn't cook all that much. He, he'd cook a couple nights a week, but you know, he'd, he'd go to, into DC and to his bookstore all day long. He'd drive 50 miles home. But rather than cook, he'd get me in the car and we'd drive another 10 miles somewhere else to eat. You know, that's how we did it. And, this is the longest I've been without restaurant cooking in my life. I've been doing so much. Have you started cooking? I've been doing so much cooking. Yeah. I mean, I have been cooking, like, cooking every day. I learned how to do really good. Just have to keep myself entertained. I got a chicken fried steak recipe. Oh. That you might want. Because I, I found out if you use masa for the breading. It's really good. Use it. It's like corn, like a corn yeah, meal. Corn, corn flour, not corn, corn meal. Flour. You buy it in. Yeah, you, know, you got to look in the Mexican section. 
and uh, it's Masa, M-A-S-A. -S -A. Mm -hmm. uh, and get your animal, and you use a, a piece of round steak and have them run it through the tenderizer once, and dip it in egg, and then roll it in that masa with however much spice you want in it. All right, I've never made a chicken fried steak for myself. Have you been doing any hunting? Do you hunt? I used to hunt. Um, I didn't hunt this year. I didn't want to drive five hours up to Archer County where my family has land I can hunt. I had access to some hunting land down here and I just, I didn't want to talk to anybody. So I, <laughs> I fish because I can, I can put a boat on a river or a lake and not have to talk to a soul. I don't know. I've never actually, I've never been hunting. I remember my dad, my dad used to hunt when I was little. And they, we lived on Long Island, but he, they would go upstate New York, you know. And, uh, yeah, and big I, woods deer. And they come back. That's hard. That's they go deer, deer and turkey. They got great big deer up there, but not many of them. You really got to hunt hard up there. Well, where I live in East Nashville, we have wild turkeys. And uh, they have become a source of amusement for me just because I love watching them and they oh, show yeah. up and they kind of they kind of come out of like they're not there one minute and they're invisible and then they're there and then they're invisible. Well, I do look forward to um, seeing you live again soon. Okay. I always have so much fun. Likewise. So much fun. And if you do talk to the band, please give them all my regards. I will. I hope they're doing well. And Kelly too. Okay. All right. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Bye.